Okay, well, thank you, Amber. As she said, today we're going to be discussing prescribed burning. And really uh, what this is a summary of mostly is, is what we present at what I call our joint agency prescribed burning workshops. Uh, as again, the, a number of agencies are, are associated or affiliated with, with these workshops, uh, not only Kansas State Research and Extension, but the Kansas uh, Forest Service, uh, National Weather Service, uh, NRCS, and, and the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and, and Tourism. So it's a, is indeed a joint effort, and many of the slides you'll be seeing today uh, come from these, this workshop material. Uh, so in terms of what I'm going to try to cover is, is we'll talk about the reasons for burning, uh, regulations, and, and some information on liability and, and how we're trying to deal with smoke management issues, uh, sources where you can obtain uh, weather information and the impacts that uh, various weather parameters have on, on uh, fire behavior. We'll talk about different types of fuels, fire types, and also then kind of get into what I call the nuts and bolts of, of planning a burn and, and conducting it uh, in the field. A little bit of information about, about historical fire frequency here in the, in the plains, uh, in the tall grass prairie area. Apparently, uh, fire frequency needed to occur maybe every two or three years out of five in order to, to keep the woody plants from invading. Uh, you know, as you get into drier regions, though, let's say the high plains, uh, maybe a fire once every five to ten years was frequent enough to, to prevent, uh, you know, major changes in, in composition. Uh, whether that fire occurred and maybe how hot it was depended on whether the area had been grazed, uh, you know, and, and of course natural fires occurred then by lightning. Uh, Native Americans uh, you learned how to use fire as, as well. And uh, so, you know, grazing and the weather patterns primarily affected the amount of vegetative growth that, that would then carry a fire. Uh, so what are the reasons for burning? And there are a number of them, and, and this is, a, you know, probably a partial list, but a number of reasons that we might want to do a prescribed burn. Uh, in some cases, uh, we're just trying to, to reduce uh, the amount of fuel that, that's present uh, that then would would uh, lessen the impact, let's say, of, of a wildfire. We may want to prepare a seedbed, uh, particularly maybe on uh, CRP, Conservation Reserve Program acreages, we might burn that off and then overseed into that, that ash to try to maybe, maybe get a, a forb, you know, or wildfire type species uh, out there uh, with, with the grass that maybe originally was established. Uh, of course, trying to reduce maybe unwanted species, particularly shrubs and trees. Uh, sometimes we just want to remove the litter. Uh, burning is known to, to enhance plant vigor and, and we can also then improve uh, wildlife habitat. Uh, from the grazing standpoint with, with domestic animals, you know, we may be able to increase herbage yield as, as well as forage quality, making maybe a, a new fresh growth more available to the grazing animal. Uh, we can improve grazing distribution and of course, increase livestock gains. As I say, these are just pretty much you know some of the some of the reasons why we might want to conduct a burn. Uh, a few pictures here, you know, just maintaining the prairie ecosystem becomes important. And if we don't burn, uh, you know, eventually we get enough buildup of fats and, and litter uh, that actually starts choking out uh, vegetation and it allows invasion over time of maybe some unwanted species. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, enhancing plant vigor. Here's a, you know, probably just a matter within a week after a fire, and, and you see removing that thatch allows sunlight to get back to that soil surface. That can enhance uh, tillering and maybe improve seed production in, in some cases. One of the key reasons that, that landowners burn in, in the tall grass prairie here in, in the Flint Hills is the enhanced gains on stalker animals. You know, these 550 to 600 pound animals going on grass. Uh, long time research has shown that, that late spring burning, uh, which, which occurs about the time these plants are just starting growth, uh, adds an additional you know, 32 pounds per animal compared to you know, the unburned pastures. Uh, the, the upper uh, graph here then, all those lines above the, the zero line, then are years in which 
steers gain more on burn pasture than they did on the unburned. So you can see that that happens most all the time. Another question that comes about is, is when should I burn? And, and that's a question that I usually, first thing I ask if people are considering doing a prescribed burn is, you know, what are you trying to, to accomplish? And then we can talk about timing. Well, some of these in terms of just getting rid of old buildup of litter, for instance, to de decrease wildfire severity, maintaining the prairie ecosystem to, to a certain extent, getting rid of that thatch and litter, improving grazing distribution. Well, timing is not as, as critical uh, when, if those are some of our primary goals. Uh, however, if we want to increase uh, the warm season grasses and improve those stocker gains, well, then the late spring seems to be the better time to accomplish that task. Uh, if we want to increase the broadleaf species, we know that that late spring fire may actually decrease some of our broadleaves. Well, if we want to maintain or increase those type of species, then the early spring or the dormant season is the time to do, to do that. I'm going to talk now a little bit about regulations in the uh, Kansas Department of Health and Environment. You know, our open burning regulations here in the state of Kansas have these four uh, requirements. Uh, notification is, is the first one there, and that's usually then to whomever is the local fire authority. That may be the fire chief or could be, you know, emergency management. But somebody usually has to be notified before you uh, start the fire or, or given permission to burn. We're not to create, you know, traffic hazards or, or smoke across airports. You know, those can be uh, damaging. Uh, and then the last one is then we need to ensure that the burning is supervised until that fire is extinguished. So these are our state regulations. Uh, counties can, can add to these and have more stringent requirements. Uh, for instance, I have not mentioned, you know, what about a burn permit? Many counties are now requiring burn permits. Liability is often cited as, as a reason people are maybe afraid to burn, and, and uh, so we need to talk about that a little bit. And, and I think in areas where uh, prescribed burning is part of the culture, is, is a normal thing that we'd expect a, a rancher to do, uh, that chances are that their farm policy would probably cover prescribed burning. But you wanna make sure uh, before you proceed, you know, don't, don't assume that that's the case. Ask questions see that as specifically mentioned in the policy, you know, get, get it clarified in writing if possible, and determine what the limits of that liability coverage is. One of the gray areas that we have with these policies though is, is what, what is actually covered. Uh, you know, if a neighbor helps you or you're helping a neighbor burn, you know, do, do one, or other, one or other of the policies cover that. Uh, and you know, so those are again, questions to ask of, of your insurance carrier. I think in, in terms of uh, liability uh, problems down the, down the road or something, if something goes wrong, you know, you want to make sure that you're following all the laws that do regulate burning. Have a burn plan, you know, and stay within the prescription that you've described in that plan. You know, obviously you don't want to burn during a burn ban or when the National Weather Service ha has, has a, you know, expressed, you know, extreme fire hazards or, or an actually a emergency conditions. If you're going to hire a burn contractor, you know, you make sure that they have sufficient liability coverage as well. One of the things that, that are being done, not only here in Kansas, but in surrounding states, are the, the uh, development of prescribed burning associations. So, so you see here the map of Kansas, and there's over a, a dozen of these burn associations that have been developed. And I think that, is, that has helped somewhat with the liability issue because what we have here now are, are individuals who, who have uh, organized together to share their equipment and, and labor. And you know, that, that's gonna go a long ways in, in helping uh, conduct a, a safe burn. Smoke, as I mentioned earlier, is, is a major impact that, that we've had and had to deal with here in the last decade or so. Her smoke obviously uh, is gonna reduce visibility. Uh, we've had accidents that have been caused by, by smoke on, on roads. And, and the other key issue, particularly from the standpoint of EPA, is there are increased health problems, particularly for those individuals that may have respiratory uh, problems. So EPA does have 
air quality monitoring sites around, typically near the, the larger urban areas. They're particularly interested in the amount of particulate matter in the atmosphere. And so you may hear numbers for PM 2.5, which is, which is the finer material. Uh, but then they're also monitoring ozone. Uh, pres prescribed burning can indeed contribute to non-attainment uh, at certain times of the year, and, and April seems to be the time that, that we often uh, need to be concerned about. There has been some new rules come along. Uh, the ozone standard was recently reduced from 75 down to 70 parts per billion. And the ozone season, in terms of these monitors, uh, I think they're on all the time, but, but they used to maybe, mainly start maybe April 1. Well, here in 2017, uh, they're going to start the 1st of March. We have a Kansas Flint Hills smoke management plan that was approved, I believe, in December of, of 2010. And uh, part of this, this uh, website that we'll, I'll show you, at least a screenshot of it, uh, has a model that predicts uh, where the smoke will go, whether or not will is likely to impact an urban area. Um, so it's important to, to use these models and be prepared in advance to take advantage of, of good burn days. Because uh, in reality, you know, if you're burning in March or April, let's say, there's probably only seven, eight days in each of those months when conditions are, are particularly ripe for, for burning. Uh, at this point in time, the, the smoke management plan is, is a voluntary plan except for one item, and that is the restriction of non-ag burning during the month of April. So here's a screenshot of our, our Flint Hills smoke management website, and you can see there kind of in the center is, is uh, something you can click on to access the smoke model, and that, that'll become active here about March 1. And in addition to the model, which, which predicts, you know, uh, on a given day based on the weather predictions where your smoke is going to head. If you light a fire in a certain county, is it going to go toward Wichita or, or Kansas City? And, you know, we also need to be concerned about uh, cities to the north, such as Lincoln and, and Omaha, that we've impacted in, in the past. In addition to the model, you can see as you look at this, this screenshot, there's lots of information here about related to, to burning, uh, you know, whether it's regulations, education, uh, and, and links then to, to various weather sites where you can get uh, up-to-date predictions of, of the weather. So mentioned weather, and of course our National Weather Service is, is a good so source and probably the best source of information that we have. There's a website, you know, weather.gov, that if you bring that up, you'll see a, a national map. You can click on your state and even zero it down then to what portion of the state that you're in. And for instance, we have National Weather Service in Topeka, Wichita, Dodge City, for, for instance. The, the weather parameters that, that we need to be primarily concerned about, one would be wind speed. Uh, you know, and something in the five to 15 mile per hour range is, is typically what we're looking for when we're doing a prescribed burn. Uh, wind, of course, supplies the oxygen. And, uh, you know, in order to have fire, we, we sometimes talk about what's called the fire triangle. And part of that is, is the oxygen. Of course, then you need something, uh, you know, to burn and then something to ignite. So those three things are, are needed to have a fire. Take one out of the picture and you're not going to have a, have a fire. Uh, you can see here with, as, as the fire moves with, with the prevailing wind, uh, you know, it kind of preheats material out in front of that and, and that then allows that fire can move along at certain certain speeds. Uh, wind speed, you know, if you get too high of wind speed, you know, then it gets harder to control those fires. They're going to move quicker uh, and also then tends to, to make the smoke uh, close, end up closer to the ground rather than going up into the atmosphere. If you have light variable winds less than five miles per hour, that's not good either because pretty unpredictable in terms of of where and how your fire might behave. Another set of information that we've recently started paying closer attention to because of, of managing smoke is mixing height and, and dispersion. Uh, and that's given on, on the National Weather Service and their predictions. And we'd like to see a minimum mixing height of 1,800 feet. Uh, mixing height then is the height above the ground where this 
where the smoke and it starts mixing in the atmosphere. Uh, that would be best when, when the fuels are dry, have fairly warm ground surface temperatures, and it's also better mixing heights occur during the daylight hours compared to night. At, at nighttime, actually the mixing height comes down and, and the smoke close, stays closer to the Earth's surface. Along with that, are, it would be transport winds. And the, this, these are the winds up, you know, up higher elevation. And again, we talk here about maybe eight to 20 miles per hour. And, and those are gonna be uh, lower during the evening and early morning hours. And we don't want them to be too slow because we won't get much, much dispersal. Sometimes the transport winds aloft can be even out of a slightly different direction, maybe than what the surface winds are. Another factor that we consider is, is cloud cover and, and uh, you know, bright sunny day, you know, the smoke will usually goes up, but temperatures are, are also warmer. Uh, that can have a, a warm temperatures can enhance the uh, ozone formation. Uh, so, you know, some partial cloud cover uh, might be ideal in terms of, of uh, managing the amount of smoke that, that occurs. Another factor that we look at is relative humidity, and we've got it here maybe a range of something like 30 to 70 percent. I think that varies a little bit depending on, on where you're at, but uh, relative humidity can change very rapidly in, in the field. You know, it's normally going to be much lower uh, in the morning. I'm sorry, it'd be higher in, in the morning and, and then decrease uh, uh, during the afternoon and probably increases after, after dark. Uh, but it's, it's a factor that we need to keep close attention to because it has a, a major impact on, on uh, fire behavior. Uh, in particular, the fine fuels, such as grasses, then they react very quickly to changes in, in humidity. Once you start dropping humidity, you know, pretty, pretty quickly, in fact, even, even at 40%, as you go below 40% relative humidity, uh, the probability of, of having spot fires, uh, you know, which is an ember traveling, maybe traveling across your fire guard and starting a fire, uh, it's greatly enhanced as that humidity declines. Temperature is something we also uh, are aware of. 40 to 80 degrees is, is a comfortable range for, for people to work in, and it's also a pretty good you know, range of temperatures for us to, to control fire. You know, if, it's, if we get too hot, uh, you know, then we get things are even more, will ignite more easily and, and move very quickly. Uh, people can, can get heat exhaustion as it gets uh, too hot, and you may have even problems with your equipment overheating. If it's too cold, you know, you start dropping much below 40 degrees, and, and uh, what, what I've heard happen is, is that sometimes, you know, people traveling down the road, and, and uh, you know, it's maybe temperatures above freezing, but we get some windshield that actually starts to form, you know, water uh, freezing in, in some of the equipment. And of course, that would not be a, a good situation. One other environmental factor that, that we usually talk about would be having uh, good soil moisture to the major rooting depth. Uh, foot of subsoil moisture is, is preferable. Uh, some people will monitor the amount of rainfall they've received. And you know, if you've gotten over the, more than four inches of precipitation uh, during that November to March uh, time frame, particularly if you're planning to burn them, you know, in, in, say in late March and April, uh, a typical late season, late dormant season or early to mid spring burn, uh, you know, having good moisture is, is important because once you burn that off and the soil starts to warm and moisture is present, then, then the plants will regrow very quickly. Okay, let's talk a little bit about fuel types and, and so forth. And here's a picture of a, of a tree on fire, you know, something that gets hollowed out and you probably can envision, you know, that burning up through the heart of that tree and maybe getting a chimney effect, which couldn't really spread fire around. Uh, two types of fuels. We have the fine fuels, uh, one hour fuels, usually less than a quarter inch diameter, like most all of our grasses. Uh, again, they respond very quickly to changes in atmospheric humidity. Uh, these fine fuels are, are easy to ignite, but they go out relatively quickly, but the fire you know, spreads quickly as, as well. We compare that then to what's considered to be a, a coarse fuel, Usually that, that involves uh, woody plants in, in particular. You know, they're larger in diameter, 
uh, takes more heat to get them ignited on fire. Uh, they burn more slowly, but then it takes a much longer time uh, before they go out. And fuels like this then, then like to, to smolder for long times after uh, the fire is started. Fuel load also affects, you know, the type of fire and, and how it behaves. You know, this particular burn picture here is, is relatively short material. You know, they ask the question, will it burn? Well, it might under the right conditions, although it's not going to go very far very fast. Uh, in most cases, we probably would like to see more than 1,500 pounds the acre of fuel load, uh, particularly here in the tall grass area. We know that's, that's a good amount to uh, tell us that, that those plants uh, were probably in good vigor as they went into the dormant period. It's enough to carry a sufficient fire to burn down uh, uh, woody plants such as eastern red cedar that maybe aren't more than three to four feet tall. Um, in some cases, you know, if we're planning to burn an area, we may have to adjust our grazing management in the previous year uh, in order to reduce that, that uh, fuel load that we have. And, and so we either reduce stocking rates or maybe a better approach is, is to provide some rest in the pastures in the late summer to allow them to regrow following maybe early summer grazing so that we have sufficient fuel to burn in the subsequent year. We'll talk about fire types a little bit and, and uh, you know, there's different terminology that we use to describe the, the types of fire and, and of course a head fire is a fire then that's moving with the wind. It's going to do so very, very quickly, uh, especially uphill. Uh, it's very high intensity. The uh, potential for having spot fires uh, from embers flying in front of those, uh, the head fire is, is greatly enhanced. We're going to have longer flame lengths, you know, uh, I've, I've seen flame lengths uh, exceeding 20 feet, feet in burning uh, some dense stands of grass. Um, these head fires do respond very quickly to shifts in, in wind speed and direction and drops in humidity. Uh, the fuel is, is consumed very rapidly and it's going to be difficult, you know, to dock, knock down or extinguish, you know, you know, a head fire. The backing fires then are, you can see here by the picture, are much uh, lower in, in intensity, shorter flame length. And if one needed to come along for some reason, uh, maybe there's, there's a front coming through that you getting here quicker than maybe you plan and you want to actually put out your fire, you know, you can go out and, and put out these backfires uh, relatively easily uh, with some, you know, good water source. But they're moving very slowly against, into the wind and uh, the temperature is actually, usually is hotter at the ground level with a backfire than it is with a head fire. The flanking fires in, is, and we'll see as we talk about uh, techniques for burning like with a ring fire. These are ones that are kind of on the sides of, of the area being burned. They have variable flame lengths, but um, kind of moving sideways to the wind. So let's get into, again, the nuts and bolts of, of doing a, a burn and we'll talk about burn plan. And so here's uh, one that was prepared by an NRCS employee year, a few years ago. And you can see, you know, it does include the, this map uh, lots of information on here and including you know where the fire will be be lit uh, the wind direct preferred wind direction uh, and information like like that and we'll talk about other types of information then that are included on the burn on the map and in the burn plan so a detailed plan uh, should be written down <clears throat> for each area that's going to be in bird burned and, and that should include again you know what is your objective or goal and we talked about that right at the beginning uh, you know, maybe your your chief objective is well. I want to uh, to burn up you know cedar trees up to four feet feet tall. You know, get ninety nine percent of them. That would be a very specific goal. Uh, we need to describe the burn area best we can. Um, you know, where is that fire break? Do we need to create a fire break? If so, where where and, and how is it going to be constructed? Um, how many people are we going to need to conduct the burn safely? Uh, the equipment that's that's going to be needed. Uh, weather conditions are also important. You know those that prescription that we talked about. You know how much wind, 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 relative humidity, and temperature uh, are we going to burn under? One needs to to locate and, and define where the hazards or precaution areas are, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The ignition plan. You know if we're going to 
start, you know, igniting more likely with a, with a backfire on, on the downwind side and, and then work your way around to the other side of, of the pasture or being burned to light your head fires. Again, it needs to have that map. And then we, we use this LCES business and, and what that refers to is, is in this part of the, the people and equipment involved, uh, and one of those, the L stands for a lookout, you know, somebody that can kind of set back in the distance and still see the fire and then is able to communicate with people doing the burn. That's the C, communication is important. We need to also note on our maps and let the people conducting the burn know where the escape routes are, you know, where are the gates in particular, how can we get out of the, the pasture if necessary. And then we also need to know where the safety zones might be with those safety zones could be uh, right adjacent to the area being burned, or but it can also be maybe areas uh, within the pasture that uh, where the fire intensity would be low enough uh, that that one would be able to go to those sites to to avoid you know problems associated with with the fire. So fire breaks <clears throat> as as we you know start getting ready to burn. You know I think fire breaks are, are a pretty critical aspect of safely can controlling the fire. And here's a picture then taken in the wintertime when we had a little snow. And you can see these, these were mowed fire breaks going up over those hills where the snow is captured. That those are of course then uh, constructed, you know, the dormant period prior, prior to actually conducting the fire. So those are mowed fire breaks. Uh, another question about the fire breaks is, is uh, how wide does it need to be? Well, that depends on, on the type of fuel. Is it, is it you know, those fine grass types or is, or is it a, a more volatile type like cedar trees? And then the amount of fuel. Our, our rule of thumb for most prescribed burns is, is that that fire break needs to be 10 times the height of the vegetation that's going to burn. So if, if let's say we have an average height of, of three feet, that means that fire break needs to be about 30 feet uh, in width. But again, that, that can vary in depending on the type of fuel. So if you have volatile fuels like here, eastern red cedars going up, uh, those embers can travel quite a distance. And we, we talk about maybe having a minimum of 300 to 500 foot wide fire breaks in those instances. Uh, if we have just a few cedars, you know, if they happen to be near the, the edge of, of our, our area that we're gonna burn, you know, we may cut those down and, and, and haul them to the interior uh, away from the edge to prevent problems with spot fires. More pictures here. So here we see another area that's been mowed. Uh, that can be accomplished in some situations, uh, but we have areas of topography where that may not be, uh, not, not, may not be able to do that successfully. However, we can use the grazing animal to uh, graze off those areas, uh, maybe by, by feeding in, the, in those sites and so forth in, in the previous summer. Uh, in early winter. Uh, one thing to be careful about if you're using a grazing animal though is, is make sure that, that it doesn't uh, leave so much manure because those that cow chips are, are pretty uh, dense and, and can catch in fire and smolder for a long time. Uh, another technique that's been developed is, is what we call a double wet line technique. So here you can see uh, the, the tractor and sprayers that, that put down a wet line. You don't see those but you can see the what they do is you come almost immediately behind where those wet lines have been uh, established and you burn out the area in between. And this of course can be done sometime ahead of the regular uh, burn. Many times a, a wet line is used. So here see some individuals where again probably had some a mowed area and a person then putting down a wet line, somebody coming along with a <clears throat> drip torch almost immediately behind them before that water has a chance to evaporate and dry off and lighting the fire inside that wet line. What you don't see then is behind the person uh, lighting the fire, you need to have somebody coming behind him with some suppression equipment to make sure that that fire that's, that's a, he's lighting does not cross over the wet line. We can also use natural fire breaks that, that may be around, whether it's cultivated ground, it might be uh, even roads, uh, areas with rock ridges and, and cliffs, walls and stuff, you have to be a little careful because those are hard areas to get into. They may work though because the, the amount of vegetation there may be low enough that the fire can be easily extinguished. 
sometimes a cattle trail on the fence can be used. Uh, but, you know, uh, in areas with water, you know, uh, lakes and streams and so forth uh, can be used. See, <clears throat> I see on this list, you know, this idea of green wheat. And you don't want to burn a uh, head fire into green wheat. You're going to hear that temperature, higher temperature will cause some damage to the wheat. But uh, and it probably would start, stop the fire, but it may not be good for your wheat yields. And, of course, in the bottom picture, you know, they're, they're an area that maybe had been previously been burned. You know, one can, can run a head fire into that area and it will and then extinguish itself. Let's talk a little bit about the, the people and the crew that's involved and what their duties are. <clears throat> Somebody needs to be in charge, and that's referred to as the fire boss. They're in charge of, of the operation. You have other individuals that are going to set the fire. Others that then are, are going to keep that fire from moving outside the prescribed area and are using very suppression type equipment. And you may have a lookout that, that is uh, uh, observing the, the burn from a, from a distance and can communicate with those doing the burn. And then we may even want to have a backup in case we, we need some additional help that we can contact and they can come uh, help with, with the burn. Weather equipment. <clears throat> uh, here's a picture of a kestrel. Nice little piece of instrumentation here that, that measures uh, wind speed, relative humidity, and temperature. Uh, and again, those are the key weather parameters that we want to measure. Uh, water, of course, is, is a very important part of doing prescribed burn. I guess an ideal prescribed burn may be one where we didn't use any water, but that would be a pretty rare situation. So you need to make sure you got adequate supply. You know, we're talking about you know, major storage, maybe a few hundred gallons. For instance, uh, we have smaller units that may have uh, lesser amounts of water, and we'll talk about. Um, but, you know, water often is used to prepare those fire breaks, so you need to have a good supply. And we can conserve the amount of water that's needed by some of these other suppression devices that you see listed here that we'll, we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, so some of that suppression equipment, you know, that one on the left is called a swatter. That's a bad name because... You know, if you don't want to, you don't actually swat fire, that just gives it oxygen and the fire moves more quickly. You drag it along the ground and smother it out. Uh, the picture in the middle is, is just using a, a fire broom to just get to, to uh, remove material uh, that, uh, so, you know, it won't burn anymore. Then the same can be said of, of the these lower there on the right. Some others types of sprayers, you know, carrying water from our ATVs, which may only have 15, 25 gallons, or the larger tanks, maybe in the back of a, of a truck. Uh, so there's a lot of times farm equipment that can be modified uh, and used to, to uh, move water around when the burn is being conducted. We also need methods to ignite the, the fire, and, and the preferred method is probably the use of a drip torch. Uh, and you see there on the left, it puts down a nice continuous line. Uh, the fuel in, in that tank is usually a mixture of about 75% oh, diesel and 25% gas. Uh, the fusee there listed on the, on the lower left is, I've not used those, but they are, they are available and, and for smaller burns uh, will indeed help you ignite a, a fire. Uh, the picture on the right is, is, is a method of fire stick, which basically is a pipe that's filled with gas, and you know it's it's uh, has a on the on the lower end that's where the fire you see igniting is is it's a cap you know on that that uh, pipe that's been etched a little bit so the, the fuel drips out and, and you light that on fire and um, many people are using it you might not think it'd be safe but uh, I've never heard any real problems using the fire stick. Communication is important. We have two-way radios. Uh, you know, you kind of get what you pay for, but they aren't too expensive. They're fairly convenient. Uh, if you have fairly level terrain and small acreages, they're going to work quite well. Do you have to be uh, aware of, of maybe interference from power equipment and even hearing well if it happens to be uh, wind, wind in the area. Cell phones are an important uh, way of communicating as well. Most people have cell phones. Uh, you can, if you have a smartphone so you can access the internet, you can get you know, updates on, on weather. Um, but we can have spotty coverage, you know, depending where you, where, you're, where you're located. And of course, you don't want them to be a distraction. You know, people need to be paying attention 
to what's going on rather than maybe trying to play a game or talking too much on, on the phone. Clothing is, is something for, that's important for personal protection and you know, having your, your body covered with you know, a hat of some kind, uh, protect your eyes, your, your arms and, and legs. Uh, normally natural fibers such as cotton work pretty well. Those who do burning on a regular basis though, the per man on the right left there has on some Nomex clothing, uh, which is actually an, is a uh, synthetic fiber, but, but it's fire, basically fire retardant. You know, wearing leather gloves, don't have steel toed boots, for instance, for obvious reasons, uh, but that's a good way to protect your, yourself. Mentioned hazards or precautionaries, and, and these are objects or situations then that alter the fire behavior, they impede movement, uh, personnel and equipment, and may increase the chance of fire escaping. Uh, some examples you know, could be fence lines themselves or particularly down fence lines in the middle of a pasture, culverts, sometimes material collects in, the, in a culvert and it blows out the other end, uh, just almost like a cannon. You know, old junk piles or, or uh, old equipment you know, left out in the pasture could be obvious hazards. Uh, utility lines, we need to be where those are and, and be careful when how we burn around them. You know, rough terrain will, will uh, reduce movability. And then wet areas uh, can be areas that, that people may get stuck in, although they can also sometimes serve a, as a uh, place, a, a safety zone to go in, in case the fires uh, not behaving like you expected. How do we ignite the fires again? Here's a person using that drip torch, uh, or lighting you know, long uh, mode area. Uh, people often then will, We'll start with a backfire and they start whiting those with what we call the strip head fire technique. And you can see there, particularly in the bottom approach where you know, one person has come along and, and started the fire and then another person is following them up, widening that black area to the point where now you get it wide enough, then we can run a, a head fire into that burned area. Ring fire technique is, is commonly used. And in this case, they've, they've started that backfire in the upper part of the pitcher. They relit their flank fires on the sides, and now these two individuals are coming together. Well, now the a head fire will, will take off, and you'll very quickly burn the area. And then you see how the how the fire kind of creates its own weather. Uh, it's, it is sucking the smoke to the interior of, of the burn, rather than most of that smoke going downwind, kind of comes up in a nice column in the middle of the, of the burn. Flank fires it can be a way of just lighting fires in directly into the wind. Uh, that, that can be uh, a safe way to, to burn, but I think you have to be a little careful, you know, where you try to do this because I, it's important that the people lighting the fires are walking at the same speed. If they can see each other, that would be good because otherwise, you know, if somebody gets ahead of somebody else, uh, that could cause some, some problems. Uh, in fact, strictly just a backfire can also be used to, to burn, but it just takes a much longer time frame compared to the ring fire. So post burn, you know, we need to look, look at things, clean up, repair equipment, uh, do a post burn evaluation. You know, did the burn go as planned? Were there any problems in, that occurred? And particularly maybe problems with communication because that's always critical. Uh, need to make an end of the season evaluation. You know, did, did the vegetation, if, as I mentioned, if our goal was was to uh, kill eastern red cedar. You know, did we do that? Uh, did we meet any other burn goals that we might have had? You know, and then we start thinking about well, when when is the next burn going to be needed, and start planning that for future. So with prescribed burning, and again, we need to have a clear objective. We need to plan, we conduct the burn, and then we evaluate those results. So prescribed burning, you know, safety is is always key not only for the individuals conducting the burn, but others that, that are located uh, adjacent or downwind in, in many cases with smoke. Uh, we need to plan. And then again, what time do we need to conduct the fire to accomplish our goals? So that, here's my contact information. That concludes uh, my prepared remarks and be glad to answer any questions that, that are available. All right. For those of you who joined after the very beginning of our webinar, there is a chat function at the bottom of your screen you can use to type in questions. Or
or if you prefer, you could use the audio function, <laughs> as long as we can keep those organized. <laughs> I do have a question about um, something you didn't cover, Walt, and that's patch burning. Can you tell me, like, what would what would be the strategy behind that, or how would one go about it? Yeah, now patch burning has has been in you know people been hearing about it, and we've got individuals actually doing it already. Uh, rather than burning the entire unit, you know, a pasture, let's say, patch burning involves usually just burning a, a portion of that, uh, which seems to work well in, in in our higher rainfall areas here, it would maybe be a third. Uh, so we burn a third in, in year one. Uh, that obviously is going to attract animals to that, that area. They'll spend maybe 60, 80% of their time grazing on, on that patch burned area. Uh, they'll, they'll use the other areas some, but, but not near as much. Uh, the next year then you burn a different patch. And then the third year, you know, the remaining third, let's say. So it's it kind of what it does is it's been described as, as somewhat like a rotational grazing uh, without a fence. Uh, primarily was, was developed and, and promoted for, for improving wildlife habitat, uh, but we've been collecting information and, and generally we've not seen any reduction in livestock performance, for instance, from patch burning versus uh, you know, burning the entire pasture. Uh, so that, that's a good thing uh, in most people's minds. All right, I'm gonna give just a couple more seconds for someone um, to type a question if there are any. Um, if not, I'm gonna say thank you very much, Walt, for presenting today. I have recorded the presentation and I will be uploading that to YouTube and sending out an email um, to everyone who registered to let you know when um, the presentation will be available online. I'll also include a link to download Walt's presentation and um, any uh, documents or fact sheets that Walt um, suggests so that you can have those all available on a single page. Um, so with that, thanks a lot for joining us and um, I have added everybody to the newsletter so you should be um, getting announcements about future webinars.